We welcome all of you here this evening in the name of the Lord. Also, those that are joining us by live stream. It is good and pleasant for brethren to dwell together in unity. Amen. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. And you just, uh, you just can't beat a commanded blessing. I covet one of those this evening, a commanded blessing. Yes, amen. Lord can just command one, doesn't make any difference how the wicked one works or thinks about it. Yes. The commanded blessing has recuperative powers. Tonight we begin... Uh, Our 63rd lesson in Genesis. We're now in the book where there's a, a focused attention upon Joseph through the end of Genesis. There'll be some other people mentioned, and we'll, uh, but Joseph, he's kind of the main character now, up until the next main character will be Moses after this, when you get to Exodus. Our text is going to open for Joseph's in prison, falsely accused. And you're going to see the hand of God working, shaping. He's working things together for good. See, we know that verse is in the Bible, and it's there because it's true. Amen. It isn't true because it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible because it's true. It's kind of a distinction you really want to pick up on that. <clears throat> 40th chapter of Genesis. And it came to pass after these things. <laughs> that's all the stuff that's happened before. It just says this, after these things. Just, that's the divine hand just cleans the highway off, you know. It came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers and against the chief of the bakers. And he put them in ward in the house of the captain of the guard under the prison, <coughs> the place where Joseph was bound. I say the place where Joseph was bound. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, and they continued to season in ward. And they dreamed a dream, both of them, each man his dream in one night, each man according to the interpretation of the dream. <laughs> Don't miss that phrase there. In other words, he dreamed the dream because of a point God wanted to make. Dreamed a dream according to the interpretation of the dream. The butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in prison. And Joseph came in unto them in the morning and looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. And he asked Pharaoh's officers that were in with him in the ward of his Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sadly today? And they said unto him, Well, we have dreamed a dream. There is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray, I pray you. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream, behold, a vine was before me, and in the vine were three branches, and it was as though it budded, and her blossoms shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. Brought forth ripe 
grapes. <laughs> and Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup. And I gave the cup unto Pharaoh's hand. Joseph said unto him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Yet within three days to Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee into thy place, and thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner when thou hast his when thou, when thou wast his butler. Uh, well, think on me when it shall be well with thee, and show kindness, I pray thee unto me. Make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also have I done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. And the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good. He said unto Joseph, I also was in my dream, and behold, I had three white baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket there was all manner of baked meats for Pharaoh, and the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. Joseph answered and said unto him, This is the interpretation thereof. The three baskets are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head from off thee, and shall hang thee on a tree, and the birds shall eat thy flesh from off thee. <clears throat> and it came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and the chief baker among his servants, and he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again, and he gave the cup unto Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker, as Joseph had interpreted to them, Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forget him. And as the world would say, one darn thing after another. That's how the world would do things like that. So how are you going to win in a thing like this? My only chance to get an audience of Pharaoh and forgets me. But see, this isn't a record of happenstance. This is a record of God's working. Amen. Remember, the Lord had given Joseph favor in the prison, so he was in charge of all the prisoners. He didn't know it, but that was so he could take charge of the baker and the butler when they got there, so, so they could tell him their dreams, so he could tell them the interpretation, so finally it all worked out that he'd get to, get to, to see Pharaoh. He didn't know all that, but that's what, what was going on. While he's in prison by the providence of God, Pharaoh becomes angry with his chief butler. What butlers did, they drank the cup of wine to make sure it wasn't poison <laughs> as their job. Nehemiah, he was a cup bearer. Here, king, let me taste it first. I'll make sure that it's not poison. You think your job's bad. That was their job. What a butler did, made the wine, then he had to make sure it was suitable. Baker, these, these were chief, there were a lot of butlers. These, these were the chief of the butlers and the chief of the bakers that did all the baking for Pharaoh. He had special cooks. And all of this that we've read in this chapter is an example of God working all things together for good. See, it's one thing to know this verse is in the Bible. Most people know it's in the Bible. I've heard a lot of people quote it, but that very proportionately very few people that commented and, and confirmed that this was true. Most of the people just say it's there. It'll all turn out. And it'll all turn out. All things work together for good. But I've heard very few proportionately, very few testimonies about it actually being worked out. So if this has happened to you, you want to be sure to testify of it. Amen. Tell it. We're seeing an example of it right here. See that saying, Romans 8, 28? That's not a parabolic saying. 
not just like nice poetry. Something, it's, a, now it's not like an ideal that may or may not be experienced, but this, this is a possibility. We hold out to you that this is the kind of the possibility. I mean, don't really look for, <laughs> don't really look for everything to work out for good. A lot of bad stuff happened. Put that behind, the devil did that. Put all that, this is how people reason. Yeah. Uh -huh. This is how they think. If they didn't think this way, they wouldn't gripe so much. <laughs> so we dedicate this to the gripers, that famous denomination that remains among us, the murmurers, why hast thou made me thus? They begin their day by saying, you wouldn't believe what happened to me. They ask people that don't know this. Maybe they know this is in the Bible, but that's all they know about. It's in the Bible. This is something that God does for all those that love him and are the call according to his purpose. The thing's not over till they're the better for it. Amen. And if they're not the better for it, it's not over yet. God's working it all together. Second, this statement doesn't pertain to everybody. Oh, I have people try and tell this to everybody. Yeah. Don't worry. It's going to turn out okay. Don't worry. They say that to everybody. Oh, for some people, it's not going to turn out okay. Everything's working together for bad for some people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Got to realize this is the truth now. Amen. God has been misrepresented, sorely misrepresented. Some people have got nothing going for them at all. Your Pharaoh, you know what that, yeah. of Moses' day, you know what that means. So these are those that love God. Not that say, not that say they love God. Those that love God. And they are people God's called, the called, according to God's purpose. They've been, they've been brought into what God's doing. God hasn't been brought into what they're doing. See, those are the people, these things are all working for good. This is not uh, for the disobedient. I'm sorry we don't have a good word for the disobedient. We don't. If you'd like to give a little relief to them, no, they don't deserve any relief. The disobedient people don't deserve any relief unless they're hungry. You can give them something to eat. The thirst to give them something to drink. That's as far as that's as far as it goes. Just, we'll be kind, and we really don't have a good message for them. This is something. Third, this is something that's known. We know. That's the first two words of the verse. We know. So this is something the people that love God and are called to go in His purpose. They know this. They know this thing's going to turn out to my salvation. I work out my salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that it, it's going to turn out to my good. Amen. There's going to come a time when I'll be glad all this stuff happened. Amen. And fourth, this is driven by the purpose of God. It's not driven by human need. Yeah. It's driven by divine purpose. Now, you know that the next verses after Romans 8, 28, people steer away from those. those. Those are verses that are, these are hard to understand. But these are the verses that follow Romans 8, 28. It explains Romans 8, 28. These are the explanation of Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to call according to his purpose. For, for, or because, whom he did, whom he did foreknow, then he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. <laughs> now, <laughs> try as you may, you can't find any human initiative in that whole passage. It's all about God, not man. It's all about God, not man. And 
This text you're reading in Genesis, it's all about God. And Joseph is a figure that is used to comment about God. Think the things get all in that passage, think of what is said that God ha is, has done or is doing. He foreknew certain people. He predestinated them. He called them. He justified them. He glorified them. That's, a, that's a fleshing out what working together for good, what that means. <laughs> Uh, I understand this may contradict the views of men, but you've got to get to the point where that doesn't make any difference yeah. to you. Mm -hmm. Yes. I find it interesting that the, ver the one verse after the text that professed Christians use as a universal applies to everybody text contains one of the most controversial words that ever has come up is predestination. I know. That will cause a lot of division. And it's in the verse right after the one that they apply to everybody, whether they deserve it or not. That's right. It is interesting, isn't it? If you like to think about things that are interesting, that's, that's, that's one that's interesting, all right. All right, well, we can't go any further without taking this a little bit further and what exactly what did God work together for good for Joseph well his brothers hated him his brothers weren't able to speak peaceably to him his brothers hated him more because of his first dream his brothers hated him even more because of other dreams and his words his, his father who was Jacob rebuked him for the dream he told him. And I'm telling you, things will work together for his good. His brothers envied him. His brothers conspired to kill him. His brothers stripped him of his coat and threw him in a pit. His brothers sold him to some Ishmaelites. His brothers delivered Joseph's bloody coat to Jacob and told him that and he concluded Joseph had been killed. The, Midian, the Midianites, they, his brothers sold him to the Midianites. The, Midian, the Ishmaelites, the Midianites sold him to Potiphar. Prosperity and success was experienced while he managed Potiphar's household. Being a goodly person of a fair countenance, that is, handsome and pleasing and form and appearance, he experienced the trickery and deception of Potiphar's wife. He was imprisoned because she lied against him. He was both chained and shackled when he's in prison. Psalm 105 says he was hurt. He was in pain. The fetters hurt him. That's what the psalm says. And he had the prisoners placed in his charge while he himself was a prisoner. Now you put all that all that in a bag and shake it up and dump it out you think you'll get good God does yeah, right. <laughs> Amen. God puts it all in doesn't omit anything doesn't omit anything says he works all things doesn't omit anything puts them all together mingles them with divine purpose sprinkles them with grace empties the bag out Right before your eyes, and sends four letters, G-O-O-D. There it is. Now, I've experienced this in my own life. I can look back and see at things, but at the time, I, <laughs> I didn't think this was good. But it did, just exactly what it says. So you, we're seeing what happens to every child of God. It's, see, we're seeing a detailed account of it here in Joseph. There he is in prison. It came to pass after these things. All of these experiences are like preludes. Now we're going to get down to really focusing on the project of God. Two, two additional prisoners come in. They're put in Joseph's care. And uh, it came to pass. That's a common phrase in scriptures. It's used over 450 times. And it came, those exact words, and it came to pass 450 times. 
You read that phrase. They come from a Hebrew word that means to exist or become or come into being or be accomplished or committed. In other words, there are words of pertaining to purpose and objective. They're the details of a master plan. And it came to pass our junctures along the... Well, I put a little resorted to some chartology here. Here's the purpose. He sent a man before them, yeah. made him ruler to save a people alive. Yeah. It came to pass of the different stages of that mm -hmm. overall purpose. Whenever you read it, it came to pass, that's another point at which this working was going on. So it's the purpose, it's language of purpose, God's purpose is being worked out. It came to pass doesn't mean it just, just, ha it just happened, happenstance, or it's, that isn't what it means. This is something God did in the process of time. This is how God fulfilled his purpose. Yeah. He didn't take things that happened independently of him and put them all together and make them. He was managing the processes yeah. themselves. Right. Now, it came to pass at just the time that these people were, that Joseph got to prison, they, they could, this couldn't happen until Joseph got to prison, that the butler and the baker of uh, the king offended him. doesn't say what they did. Some conjecture, they tried to poison him. I don't know whether they did or not, but it was something like that. They, they conspired to do some kind of harm to probably say we got a bad president. Well, no, we don't want to talk like that. I'm sorry. I guess we don't want to talk that way. That may be what they talk. We got a bad president. We got to do something about it. <laughs> of course, the scripture does say to honor the king. <laughs> they didn't do it. So they provoked him. And he put them in prison. The only reason now these people are even mentioned mm -hmm. are because they're connected with what God's doing. Or we'd have never had read about them at all. Mm -hmm. Pharaoh or the baker or the butler, we'd have never heard anything. Or Potiphar or Potiphar's wife. We wouldn't have heard a word about these yeah. people in Scripture if they weren't intersecting with what God was doing. Amen. Now here's a few people connected with Joseph. We, we would never have known anything about these people except for Joseph. There was the man that told Joseph where his brothers were, remember? Yeah. He went to find his brothers. It was that man. We don't know who it was. There was this company of Ishmaelites. There was uh, some Midianite merchandise merchants that were with him. There was Potiphar and Potiphar's wife and the baker and the butler. And that's, if it wasn't for Joseph, they would, yeah. we wouldn't have known these people exist. See, there's people in your life that the only reason you know anything about them is because they're playing a part yeah, in what God's doing with you. Yeah, and it's not always a good part. Yeah. So maybe like Potiphar's wife. Yeah. Uh -huh. huh? Yeah. Amen. That's the only reason you know anything about them. See, God's using all... This is how great God is. He uses honorable vessels and dishonorable vessels. Sometimes it seems like there's more garbage cans than there are cooking, cookware. <laughs> that's the way it looks. But that, that's only true if there's just a lot of garbage that's got to be carried out. So sometimes there's a lot of garbage God's got to carry out, so he uses a lot of garbage cans. He doesn't use the cooking vessels to carry out garbage. Ah, the honorable vessels aren't used for ignoble purposes. No, no, uh-uh. So they have uh, some of God's work requires these garbage cans. And God puts them, uh, see, so they are put in ward. They're put in a confinement, we would say. The captain of the king's guards always be, already been identified as Potiphar. Mm -hmm. yeah. Potiphar's the captain of the king's guard, and this is just shortly after this incident with Potiphar's wife. <laughs> so Potiphar, he must have... Joseph was there. This must have stirred up his mind. I knew Joseph was a faithful man. I Things haven't been going so well in a prison here, and I sure don't want 
sure don't want Pharaoh angry with me. I think I'll put the prisoners in Joseph's hand. Hey, you can see how these things kind of... Joseph had to be long enough in his house so that he, the captain of the guard, he's not mentioned by name because there's no purpose for mentioning his name now. But, yeah, that's who that was. And the king put him, and the Holy Spirit makes a point of saying this, in the place where Joseph was bound. That's where they put if all the places they could go, that's the place where they would. Or if all the places, if all the places Joseph would be sent, that's the place where he was sent. Get these three men together so I can do a little bit of work here. See, the place wasn't primarily known primarily for who was managing it, like Potiphar. It was noted for who was there, who was Joseph. That is the way he would say it. We, you'd never say this. If someone was sent to prison, you would say, sent to the prison where Joe Dokes is down there. We'd say, we sent to a prisoner, and so-and-so is the, the prison keeper, ward of the prison. But notice how he identifies the prison as the one where Joseph was. <laughs> Isn't that good? God won't allow Pharaoh to keep his people alive. Yeah. I know. God's going to use his one of his people to keep his people alive. So there they are down where Joseph was. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with, the, with them and he served them. Interesting that he's what it says. He served them. They continued in the season for a season in the ward. How long we don't know. Or the word used season could be a day, it could be in a year. We don't know how long they were there. From all outward show, it appeared to have been a judgment of Pharaoh that sent him there. But actually, it was God who sent him there. Now I want to state the purpose again for which Joseph was raised up. It's found in Genesis 50 and verse 20, to save much people alive. And it was the people of Israel who he's talking about specifically and all the surrounding nations too. Now, but rather than that, it really shouldn't be necessary to do this, but in our religious culture we've got to do this. We've, we must not allow for small thinking. Uh, you don't want to be noted as being a small, piddly thinker. Yeah. Just thinking what they call piddling things all the time that aren't really of any consequence. And you're annoyed by things that are like, who cares yeah. that this happened to you? It's not that important. Mm -hmm. But see, there's a self-centered society. There's just an awful lot of just trivia that people yeah. are caught up in. They talk about it, and they plan around it. And this is their whole life is a bunch of trivia. You want to learn not to think of small things. Think big thoughts. And the thoughts that tie in with what God's doing. It'll help you survive. Yeah. It'll help you to weigh things properly. Yeah. Not to get pulled aside into bitterness and things like this. Amen. Now, each one of them had a dream. They said they dreamed a dream. Sounds like it was one dream, but it was just two dreams, but... They were kind of for the same purpose, same ob same objective. They were from the Lord. Yeah. They were unique. He wants to establish Joseph as an authority on dreams. That's, That's right. the, oh, it's a, Joseph can't do this. He didn't say, hey, everybody, everybody's got a dream. Because yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure that we've no example of him interpreting a dream before this. Yeah. Huh? He didn't interpret those two dreams he had. He just told them what he saw. Yeah. About the stars bowing down to his star and the wheat bowing down to his. But he didn't interpret them. His, his father interpreted it. Jacob said, you, be, you were going to bow down to you. You see, he kind of interpreted Joseph. We have no record of Joseph interpreting a dream prior to this. And when he did, he, he seemed to do it with a tremendous amount of confidence. He doesn't balk at it at all he just that's what happens when God's working with you yeah, when Moses come, come time for Moses to speak to Pharaoh hey, he didn't come in 
hide behind a pillar someplace and try and work up the energy to speak. Yeah. He just stepped right out and spoke. Same with Peter on the day of Pentecost. He just steps right out and speaks. Paul standing before King Agrippa. He just steps out and speaks. John the Baptist, he just sees Herod sin. He just steps up and speaks. That's what a person does when they're full of the Spirit, see? Amen. When the person's being used by God, they could care less what the person they're talking to thinks about what they say. Now, this, you can't teach people to do this. You to, <laughs> if you try and do this on your own, you'll just fail. That's, uh -huh. So these there's a setup. The dreams are tailored for each man as they pertain to Joseph's work. Now, this uh, confirms that God doesn't work by discernible patterns. This is not the way God works. If you recognize God's work, it's what he did, not how he did it. He that identifies him. Abimelech, for instance, when he gave a dream from God, he understood full well what was going on. God said, you're a dead man. You're a dead man, Abimelech. Hey, you're going to be dead before the morning comes because you got another man's wife in your house. I dedicate this to all cavorting ministers that has another man's wife in their house. They're dead men. That's the things, and that's the things rectified. Oh yeah. How Joseph, um, right after this dream, he comes into them. And it says, Joseph came in unto them in the morning. Oh, he's taking care of his prisoners. Came and check on the prisoners each morning. See, a good leader checks up on the people, finds out what, what the status is. He was going to see if they stood in need of anything. Make sure. He didn't want... Uh, he doesn't think this right now, but he doesn't want, when his name comes up, he doesn't want to have a record of bad abuse, of abusing the prisoners. Ooh, this, when you come to stand before Pharaoh, he doesn't know this, but he, it, God's ranging it. When he comes before Pharaoh, he doesn't want someone saying, yeah, we heard Joseph, hey, you ought to see what he does to the prisoners. <laughs> Takes their stuff from them and treats them bad. You don't want that kind of report. You want a good report, and so... This record is here to show you God's working with him, and he's thinking about the prisoners. He didn't let his past make him bitter. Amen. Well, but see, that maybe, they, maybe it could have. His brothers hated him, couldn't speak to him peaceably. So forth, I give you the things. He could have lived. This isn't all that long after that stuff happened. But there's no evidence at all that he lived in a state of bitterness over those things that happened to him. And we want to learn from this, see? God's people had to learn from this. Send, the, send all the psychiatrists home. Yes. Tell all the counselors to vacate and get a job and make an honest living. Stop telling the people what to do. Yes. God's already told them what to do. One thing is don't be bitter. Don't let bitterness get hold of you. Yes. Whatever's happened to you. Amen. Think of the things Paul said happened to him. I'm making a point here. Mm -hmm. That before the law, before all these things were spelled out doctrinally, Joseph lived out what we're told to live out. He lived it out without the advantage right. of the forgiveness of sins, justification, the presence of the Holy Spirit, and the good promises of God. He lived it out wasn't bitter. Paul said in Ephesus, I fought with beasts after the manner of men. I don't even know what that was. He doesn't tell you that's how incidental it was. See, a man would have written a, a whole book about that. When I fought with beasts in Ephesus, he just mentions it and passes on. In Asia, he said, I was pressed out of measure above strength in so much as the spirit of life. I don't know what all was involved there, but he just about gave up. He was troubled on every side. He was perplexed. 
cast down. He was delivered to death for Jesus' sake. He experienced unworthy dishonor, evil report. He was represented as a deceiver. Although he had a glorious message, he was unknown. He was sorrowful. He was poor. The Jews had him beaten five times with 40 stripes save one. Four times he was beaten with rods. Some years ago there was a military man that molested a foreign girl and he was to be beaten with four with a rod, four strikes of a rod and had obtained international mediation because they didn't think he could survive the four strikes with a rod. Four times Paul was beaten with rods. Once he was stoned, three times he shipwrecked, spent a day and the night in the deep at his treading water. He is constantly on the move. He was in danger from waters, that's rivers. He was in perils of robbers. He was threatened by his own fellow countrymen. He was threatened by the heathen. He was in perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, perils among false brethren. He experienced weariness from his labors. He experienced pain in his labors for Christ. He often experienced sleepless nights. He experienced hunger and thirst. Often he went without any food at all. He experienced cold and nakedness. And Alexander the coppersmith did him much evil. But he wasn't bitter. I say he wasn't bitter. This wasn't the theme of his conversation. Whenever he got Paul alone, he didn't start talking about this. Yeah. If you're prone to grumbling, you got to get the victory over it now. Amen. you got to do it. Amen. This doesn't justify what happens to you, what happened to you, and we're not suggesting it does. We're just saying you've got no right to be bitter. Yes. Amen. Don't, don't let it happen. <laughs> Yes. It does say, well, considering that if Joseph had been bitter about all these things that have happened to him, he might not even have any help to what would come to him. Mm -hmm. Well, that's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. That's right. That's true. Mm -hmm. And he certainly wouldn't have been in any shape to look out for the needs of the yeah. prisoners. <laughs> Amen. The bitterness po poisons your own well more than anything that's else. That's right. Mm -hmm. So he looks at him and says, what? What are you sad about today? Which means they weren't sad every day. So even they, even they didn't live in bitterness and fret. They, they, they managed to have a good countenance. So it was strange. I mean, what, how come you're sad today? This is in prison now. We're talking about being in prison. These weren't like air-conditioned units with on-the-wall TVs. It, what, this is what it was. I think I've mentioned this to you before, and you get old, you tell, tell the same story a lot of times. I don't mean to do it, but when I was the head of the maintenance department, I even forget what the occasion was, but I was kind of down in the dumps one day, and I was moping through the machinist department, and the sheet metal shop was over on the side, and a fellow worked over there, hollered out, hey! I thought Christians were supposed to be happy. I woke up. I wasn't aware. I was looking the way I did. I, I never have forgot that. Yeah, if you're if you're happy, like notify your face, because <laughs> that's what we see. <laughs> so I'm saying you had, you can manage your countenance, brethren. Even these people. Even these people. Knew it's bad enough I'm in prison. I'm not going to walk moping around on top of that. Why are you sad today? God, the leaders are perceptive of the condition of their people like he was. Even though God's governing the situation, but I'm showing you how God how God would think of alert. If you're a prisoner, you got a chain around your neck, you're in shackles yourself, and you drag your chains over to where the butler and the baker are and check out on them in the morning and find out they're, hey, what? You know, they look and see this chained up prisoner. Well, how come you're so sad today? 
you gotta kind of get the pic <laughs> you gotta gotta get the picture. You may recall the same question was asked to Nehemiah, who was a yeah. king's butler. Artaxerxes, the king, come in one day and he says, Nehemiah, and Nehemiah says, I was never sad. I was never one time sad in the presence of the king. He made a point of telling you that. Not me. And there's some people have never been anything but sad before everybody. Just, uh, up and around. Big load on their back. See, I'm making a point here. He asked Nehemiah, "Why you never been? What's wrong? You've never been sad before." And then he told him about Jerusalem. He had something to be sad about, and it wasn't about what happened to him; it's what happened to God's city. See, <laughs> so you might someone might say, "What are you sad about?" So I've been thinking about the state of the church. How the walls are broken down. God's people aren't being fed. Now, that's a legitimate cause for sadness there. So there's a lesson to be learned from this, from Nehemiah's experience, that men have a degree of control, even sinful men, have a degree of control over their appearance and how they look. And believe it or not, your countenance can help or bring another person down. Those of you who have preached, you know, you know about the burden of the countenance. Some people, you get hard to look at them when you preach. You get hard to look at them. See, be what kind of person that whoever's speaking can look to you, and it'll cheer them up when they look to you. Well, they said, well, <laughs> we'll be right up front with you, Joseph. We had a dream, and we can't find anybody to interpret it. What they're saying is we, we can tell these were important dreams, but we, we can't find anyone to interpret it. The thing they had in common is they both had a dream. They had the same time. Neither of them had any idea what they meant. Both dreams needed to be interpreted, so it was in a sense like they one dream. There wasn't any distinction as far as knowledge was concerned. There's no interpreter. We know from later records in this that, that Egypt did have people that said they could interpret dreams. Pharaoh's going to call for them later when Joseph's there to interpret a dream. But these, uh, so these have made an effort. Nobody could interpret the dream. And Joseph, he says an interesting thing. Now remember, he doesn't have a Bible. Law hadn't been given. His will interpretation belonged to God. So ask him. Well, that's not what he said, though. He said, ask me. <laughs> have you tried this? Someone have it. They, they, they tell him some, something that's a concern to him. They say, listen, only God can do something about this. Go ahead and tell me what you got there. <laughs> it's how God works. He works through his people. Only God can interpret dreams. Tell me now, what are your dreams? Isn't that good? <laughs> you can do this. I used to do this. I envisioned myself as the pastor of Lever Brothers. I was the Lever Brothers pastor. Pretty soon he got around. Why had all kinds of people saying, tell me someone, pray for this, or someone's sick at home, whatever. I greatly delighted in it. It was kind of a good side job, so to speak. Interpretations belong to God. As far as we know, he hadn't had an interpretation of a dream to this point. If he did, it's not recorded. Not read of any dream that he interpreted, but he, he just speaks with Remarkable confidence. See, this is what happens when a person, when God is working in a person, this is the effect it has on the person. They have this confidence and assurance that can't be explained. They just get up and say, brethren, I mean, this is that which is prophesied by the prophet Joel. Just, see? 
Well, I'm not careful to answer about this matter, Paul says. I can, I can spell this out to you. Now, I know, I know Agrippa. I, you know a lot about the Jews. I, to just speak with this confidence. This is what happens when God's working in you. Yes, uh, Judah. The, the common thing to say about dreams, just any dream, is you can't remember it for more than two or three minutes after you wake up. But this is not true with dreams that are God-given. Yeah. When God gives you a dream and there's a message contained in the dream, you will remember it because it came from God. Yeah. And God will not let you forget what He has told you, yeah. what He's given to you. Unless you're Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. <laughs> this confidence that He had, you mentioned, was based in the Lord and not Himself. Because yeah. remember, right. Joseph himself mm -hmm. had some dreams, and we don't know that he knew the interpretation of those dreams. Yeah, I know it. So yeah. if he was reasoning in himself, he could have been uh, hesitant because, well, I didn't know the interpretation of my own dreams. How are, am I going to be able <laughs> yeah. to tell these other men their dreams? But his confidence was in the Lord. Yes. Amen. Mm -hmm. See, this, mm -hmm. to me, this tells you that he'd been relying on God while he was in prison. The details of it aren't spelled out, but he'd been living by faith while he was there. Maybe he'd been going over his own and perhaps had seen some things about it, but he had this confidence. But he speaks of the boldness of faith, telling the baker and butler only God knows, but listen, you can tell them to me. Because I, like I'm in contact with God. There's a time to speak, Solomon said. It's a time to speak and a time to be silent. This was a time to speak. Yeah. Well, the butler tells his dream. He said in the dream, he says, a vine was right, right in front of me. And, and while I was looking at it, it started growing and buds and blossoms around it. And pretty soon his ripe grapes are hanging on it right there in front of me and I took him right while the grapes were still in a cluster on the vine I squeezed him into the Pharaoh's cup and then I gave it to Pharaoh now <laughs> men I have a penchant for unnecessary details I've known people that would look at this and they'd want an explanation for every little Thing, like how come the vine was before him? What does that mean? Or the vine had three branches. Well, he's going to tell him that did have a significance. So I saw it as though it budded. And what, what, is that, what does that mean? Uh, Pharaoh's cup. How come Pharaoh's cup was in my hand? And How come I took the grapes and crushed it in the cup? And You see, the bee, a carnal mind would process this completely different than someone who's interpreting the dream. The dream had a purpose, and it wasn't like a bunch of details. There were some details in it, but only those details will be mentioned. Joseph now has a work to do in behalf of God. He doesn't ask. Now, repeat that again. Let's go, let's, let's go over that again now. I want to make sure I got the facts again now. Mr. Butler, go, go over that. He doesn't do that. He just grasps the thing one time through. He's got it. seems to me that a person who can be trusted with suffering can be trusted with insight and understanding. Huh? See, how you handle suffering, and Brother Paul made a point of this last Lord's Day, remember? How you handle suffering will determine what you get from God. If you're like a lousy steward of suffering, you're not going to be getting a lot of things to handle, not from God. So he doesn't go into the significance of all the details. He just heads to what this application, what this thing is, is all about. He boils it down to several, just five points. The three branches are three days. All right, that within three days, Pharaoh would lift up your downcast countenance. It would lift up your head. That's what it means. Then lift up. You're going to be encouraged at three days from three days from now. Your situation is going to change. Yeah. 
Pharaoh's going to put you back in a palace. Pharaoh's cup will again be in your hand, and you'll be restored to the butler. You'll, so he boiled it all down, those few words, that boil that dream all down. Now, when we approach the word of God, it's what God is saying that must be comprehended. What, what is he saying in this? What's the message? It's got to come across. Amen. We must not allow ourselves to be drawn aside to view incidental details that aren't that important. Yeah. If what's, what's the message? Mm -hmm. If we miss the purpose of the word, we failed. Yeah. If we fail to see how it bears upon our manner of life, we failed. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then uh, after telling them the dream... He says, now, when it's going well with you and when you're not in prison anymore and things worked out for you real, when you, when you can see your situations better, and I just, you just wait until that happens. What I've, what I've told you come to pass, things are going well. Uh, could you think about me? Just, just think about me. See, that shows he was a, he was a man. Yeah, amen. He had feelings just like everybody else has, but he didn't allow his feelings to govern him. But see, he, he knew that the Pharaoh, he's a, he's a pretty fair man. Just remember me. Show kindness to me, he said. Show, show some kindness to me. Be kind to me. Now, here it was that he wouldn't do anything to Joseph directly in prison. But he mentioned with somebody who could do something about it, and that was showing kindness to Joseph. Yeah. Uh -huh. So when you see someone, and you're not personally able to meet their need, but you go to God about it, yeah. Yeah. you are actually being kind to that person. Amen. Amen. Huh? Yes. As do you love the brethren when you do that for the saints. Amen. And for your enemy, you're being kind to them. When you do that, see, I always, he says, let me tell you about myself. I haven't, I haven't told anybody about this, but I was stolen away. I was kidnapped, we'd say. I was kidnapped when I was a boy, taken by force yeah. and against my will. Our kidnapping or man-stealing, as it's called, under the law, the death penalty. Yeah. Whoever stole a man or kidnapped a person, the death, it was capital punishment. Why? Because man's made in the image of God. No man has a right to kidnap another person. So it was a capital offense. But he seemed to sense the wrongness of this, even in those spiritually primitive days. I was kidnapped. <laughs> Out of the land of the Hebrews. The land of the Hebrews. Now, sometime after this, it's not too long after this, all the Hebrews that were in the land moved to Egypt, and there were 70 of them. Not counting Joseph, who was already in the land. 70 people living in the land, but it was, the, it was their land. Isn't that interesting, huh? I was kidnapped out of the land of the Hebrews. How many there are we? Just 70 of us there. And we uh, didn't have any king or anything like that. It was our land. That's right. yeah, it's a faith, it's faith language. Amen. See, Jacob, he passed, he passed that along. This is our land, son. Right. He didn't never conclude it by just what was happening. But it was their land, land of the Hebrews. God gave it to them, see. Whatever God gave you, you can claim it. This is mine. Yes. Amen. God gave it to me. And there was no injustice in him doing this because God said it was his land, my land. He calls it my land. It was God's land. God took his land. He gave it to the Hebrews. So it was perfectly, yes. a perfectly legitimate transaction. Yes. And beside that, Joseph said, I have done nothing that I that they should put me in the in in the dungeon. Now you get a little another picture of the prison. It was called a ward and a house. Now he calls it a dungeon. So it may have been in the house, but it was underground. 
a dungeon. I did nothing to deserving to be there. Now, throughout history, even including the Lord Jesus Christ, they have challenged people on this matter of justice. Godly people have challenged their enemies to find a fault in them. Yeah. Oh, now, <laughs> Christians wouldn't dare do this today. Oh, you won't hear an average preacher say, now, who's going to lay someone to my charge? That damn it. Come on. Anyone can convince me a sit? See, this is this. You don't hear this kind of talk today, but that's the way godly people talk. Come on now. You've been finding fault. Just exactly what fault did you find in me? A legitimate one. Jesus said to the people before him, Which of you convinces me of sin? Step forward. Step forward. Who is it? Yeah, nobody stepped forward. Jesus said, many good works have I done. I've shown from my Father. For which of those good works do you stone me? See, nobody. I'm showing you that God has a penchant for justice. God has let himself be made known as the God that's against injustice. And so wherever injustice has occurred to his people, his people will challenge, will challenge that injustice. One time when Paul was in Philippi, they unjustly beat him. You remember him and Silas? They threw him and put him in prison. Then after a while, they concluded, we made a mistake, and they told the prison, let him go. Let, let, him, let him go. Paul said, no, no, no. Ah. Said, uh, they've beaten us openly and condemned us being Romans and have cast us into prison and now do they thrust us out privately or privately nay very to let them come themselves and fetch us out we're going to stay here till they come and bring us out <laughs> see that yeah. now, you have to know how to apply stuff like this but no. you'll have times when you have to apply you have to I've had in the past, I didn't have many of these, thank the Lord, but fracases with men that said they were elders, you know, that they weren't, and so I didn't recognize them, and it upset me. So I just challenged them in the open. You men that think you know everything. Tell, tell the people what you voted on. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's what I did. You tell the people what you voted on. How you want to shut on part of the services. I, I tell them. Yeah, injustice has to be challenged. No matter where it is. But you have to be a man of God to do it. Paul stood before Felix. He said, now they didn't find me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues nor in the city. Neither can they prove the things were, were thereof they now accuse me. They can't. See, he stood up. Challenge the people. Paul said to the Jews in Rome, neither against the law of the Jews, neither against the temple, nor yet against Caesar, have I offended in anything at all. So Joseph's right in that, uh, right in that train. Holy men were not afraid to point out their own innocence. That was obvious enough that if anybody pursued it, they'd know they were telling the truth. Now you want to live so you can do that. Amen. A person who lives sloppily and we all make mistakes. Is that right? Well, it depends on how you view that. It's your job not to make them. Yep. At least not in a public way. So now the, the, the baker he's listening on says he saw the interpretation was good. I mean, it was favorable. Yeah, yeah. Hey, that's a good interpretation. This must be what Joseph does. He gives a kind of a good side to your dream. So I, I, I'll tell him my dream. He'll tell me something good, too. Well, people still think like this now. They still think like this. Tell us something good. We, we can tell you preach that good stuff all the time. Well, some people, we don't preach that good stuff, too. So I'll tell him my dream too. There are still people, as I say, who think everything comes from God 
Everything, everything that comes from God is favorable, and only the devil gives bad things. People think this. They don't think like Job. What? 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 Shall we receive good at the hand of the Lord, and shall we not receive evil? I can almost hear some of the old charismatic preachers I've heard. Well, yeah, you can say that, because God didn't do that. Satan did that. And we tell people like that, go home. Please don't be in public anymore. You don't know how God is. If everybody was good all the time, yes, that is true. God would say good things all the time. But everybody's not. Sometimes thou hast not done well. Sometimes they had to hear something like that. Now, how will Joseph interpret the dream? Here's... He says, I'll tell you my dream. He says, I also was in my dream. So I was, I dreamed about myself, and I had three white baskets, three white baskets on top of my head. But something was only in the basket on top. There's all kind of baked goods in the basket on top. And as I was walking along, the birds were eating the meats, the bread meat, on, in that basket. Well, Joseph, what are you going to do with that? That's dreamology. That's a, that's a supposed science, a dreamology. I mean, what they do, how would they do that? He doesn't, uh, Joseph, he doesn't hesitate mm -hmm. at all. He says, well, this is the interpretation. Just yeah. right off. This is the interpretation. He doesn't say, oh, let me pray about this for a while. A couple of days I'll I'll let you know what I find out. Now, some dreams are like that. Like Daniel, he, Daniel and the three Hebrew children, they had to inquire of God in this pretty tough dream that they had to interpret. But he doesn't. He doesn't need that, that in this. He says, this is, this, this is. See, those two words, this is. Those are found 343 times in the scripture. This is. And not this can be, this is. This is the book of the generations of Adam. So if anyone comes up with any other idea about man, this is. This is, this is Noah, this is the fashion of the ark. This, this, this is it. This is a token of the covenant of circumcision, Abraham. This is my covenant. This is the covenant that I'll make. It. See, this, this is. It's something that exists, that is. It's the work of God. Jesus said, this is the work of God, that you believe on his son whom he has sent. He said of himself, this is the bread that came down from heaven, wherever a man eats, you'll live. This is, see, this is, you're seeing it. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. This is the true grace of God, wherein you stand. This is the promise of God, even eternal life. See, this is, this is what we call an affirmation. And the power of God is in the affirmation, not the explanation. Amen. That's right. now, sometimes we do have to have explanations, but the power, the purpose of the explanation is to get hold of the affirmation. Yeah. Right. <laughs> the three baskets are three days. Mm -hmm. Yet within three days, Pharaoh shall lift thy head off. Mm. <laughs> Here it is, they lift up your heads. Because they're going to take your head off. Lift your head off and you'll hang you on a tree and the birds are going to eat your flesh. It's just rapid, rapid fire. Could you imagine the baker saying, thank you very much. It's excellent interpretation. Yeah, See, People don't always thank you when you say you were, give your word from God either, do they? Some people, truth is not pleasant. For other people, it is. It all depends on the condition of the heart. Your heart, your faith, your hope, and this sort of thing, this determines whether the word is good and pleasant or whether it's the other. If you're Eli, you say, blessed is the name of the Lord. That's right. <laughs> good is the word of the Lord. Good is the word of the Lord. Let it be as he has said. All right, then, then that's the end of the incident. Now, that, see, this would have, could have been a, pretty, a series of newspaper articles. This could have been a series of articles. 
But instead of just a few words, it's wrapped up, and then we proceed to the fulfillment of it. Three days later, what is it's Pharaoh's birthday. It's Pharaoh's birthday three days later. And he throws a big feast for all of his staff. And he gets the baker and the butler out of prison and, and brings them to the feast too. So he lifted them both up, see? Yeah. Made a feast unto his servants. Just as Joseph said. And he restored the, just like Joseph said, he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again. And he gave the cup to Pharaoh's hand, just like Joseph said. Fulfilling precisely as Joseph said three days later. But he hanged the chief butler. That's all it says. Joseph said he'd take his head from off of him and hang him. And hang him. He hanged him, just like he said. And then the Holy Spirit adds the word, as Joseph had interpreted to them. So it was just exactly what he said. The Spirit doesn't leave the matter without stating that this is what Joseph said. Yeah, amen. He doesn't leave you like marveling at the incident. Mm -hmm. And you better not cross Pharaoh. Whoa, whoa, whoa. He takes it back to his, like Joseph. It's Joseph's reputation that God was establishing, not amen. Pharaoh's. Amen. If anything was established about Pharaoh, it was that he was a fair and a just man that will be able to recognize who Joseph really is. So men have been told the facts. They've been provided with the message of an our day. They've been told the facts. They've been provided with the message of the great salvation and how they can avoid condemnation. And there's no excuse for anybody being condemned. None at all. No one's going to be able to say, if only I had known. No, oh, God has made sure everybody knows. Because it's his reputation, see. People are going to be saved or lost because of what God says, not just because of what they've done. God's going to make this pronouncement. It's going to be a just pronouncement. Yes. I don't know if you shared this, but she made... Uh me aware of the fact that God is so faithful that he will send a messenger to share the gospel every day to somebody who has been wicked all their life so they will not have an excuse. Oh yes, mm -hmm. absolutely right. Because that is exactly what the position I was put in with Jim's brother. Yeah. And I was there every day and I shared things with him yes. and I wasn't. I, I shared it with love, but I told him the truth. Mm -hmm. oh, I yeah, told him the truth. Yeah. Speaking the truth in love, That's right. mm -hmm. we can't take that away from anybody, but it particularly is talking about the saints talking to one another. That's, yeah. That text is specifically talking about that, but that doesn't mean you say the truth with a sneer, but mm -hmm. you have to say the truth. Yeah. That's right. that you, no, that's the correct assessment. And look what happened. In the wake of all this, the butler forgot Joseph. See, why? Well, God's got to show you that even though men forget, he doesn't. Can a mother forget her sucking child? God says, yes. Yes. But I can't forget mine. See? So he's establishing here that, yeah, if ever anybody should have remembered Joseph, it should have been that butler. But some people can't handle success, you know. They, so he forgot. Now it, look, now it looks like he's back where he was before, see. Butler may prove unfaithful, but God won't. And so this chapter ends with Joseph in the, in the hole of despair, supposedly again. Here he is. It looks like things aren't working out at all, but things are working out. Now, legion is the name of people who have put their trust in men and been disappointed. In fact, 
I would suppose that to some extent all of us have uh, experienced this, being disappointed by the conduct of someone we more or less trusted and expected them to conduct themselves better, they disappointed us. Well, I imagine, I don't, I don't know that anyone came and told Joseph this because I don't know that anyone else knew what Joseph said. But after some time passed, he must have concluded, well, he must have forgot. I imagine there was talk in the prison about the butler being back on, back in the king's care and having his station again, but he forgot Joseph. All right, maybe, maybe, maybe you've experienced this. Maybe you've experienced this. You, maybe someone you, you've been banking on him, you been a great helper to you, and you, you got to kind of relying on him, and then they failed you. You don't know why. You kind of can figure out, well, it wasn't out of, they hated me, I, I know there wasn't this, but I can't wonder why they didn't, wonder why they didn't remember I was having this trouble. But that's God testing you. See, you, you, you want to think that way. That's God testing you. That's God getting you ready for deliverance. See, before you can appreciate deliverance, you got to have like all hope kind of has to, all hope so far as the flesh is concerned has to be done away before you can really appreciate deliverance. That's what, it's what happened here. God's just working like he always, always works. Long-suffering. The Word of God tells us vain is the help of man. That's stated two times in the Psalms. Psalm 60, 11 and 108, 12. Vain is the help of man. So you don't want to hang your hopes on what men do. Even though sometimes it looks like, if I can get this fellow to speak for me to the, for the job, I'll get it. Or whatever, is he? Again, it says, put not your trust in princes, nor in the son of men, in whom there is no help, his breath goeth forth, he returns to the earth, and that very day his thoughts perish. That's Psalm 146, verses 3 and 4. Don't try. Have, haven't you found out that we have to learn to rely on God? That's a lesson you, you like, learn. And yeah. as you progress through life, you become more certain of this, and you lean a little. At first, people just kind of lean lightly on the Lord. They're not... Not because they're stubborn, they're just, they don't know. Pretty soon, if God proves himself faithful, and, and in the experience of life, you find out God is, God is faithful, and then you lean, the, lean, you lean the weight of your soul on him. Yeah. That's what Joseph yeah. is learning to do here. Yeah. I did include in this uh, lesson a little list of the first I keep a track of. Yeah. And up to this point, 338 that, that I found. There may, there may be more. But uh, I go through the text for carefully as I can, but that I know I happen to know, but that's not always good enough. But in other words, wherever you're dealing with first the, the first time it happened, it's like a it's like establishing a border yeah. on how you think about God. And it's in, in uh, it's gradually it's enlarging. The book of Genesis is gradually it's it's getting bigger. You're learning more about God, how he works, how he thinks, how faithful he is, how nothing escapes his attention, how he never forgets his own, he's not unrighteous to forget, and so forth. It's a it'll build your faith, it'll do it. Any of you have a word like you like to add tonight? Yes, Sister Tasha? Yeah, hearing that if Joseph hadn't had his dreams and it might have been strange to him. That's right. Amen. You know, he might have just chalked up these dreams to something weird, you know. I like guess brothers knows? did his. Yeah, yeah who knows? <laughs> just a strange dream. It's nothing. Um, and two, these dreams may have provoked him to consider his own dreams oh, again. Oh, amen. I thought about that. And yeah. they could have been this hope. His hope was rekindled again. Even amen. though he was in, in prison, his hope now could have been rekindled because of the dreams of the baker That's and the good. butler. Mm -hmm. yeah, I have a question. That did happen. Yeah. yeah. 
Yes, yeah, Sister Hannah. Um, God interprets the dreams to Joseph. The only way for Joseph to interpret the dreams, it the two interpret the two dreams, is for God to do it through him. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Sister Melissa. I was thinking about this. Um, we've talked about it before about the details. You know, we've learned in Genesis how how they didn't have to have all these details about yeah. different things. And I was thinking that this is key to working out your salvation Amen. with your children. Amen. Uh, but knowing that God works all things out for your good, I know just from personal experience, learning this through my walk of faith, yeah. that you don't have to worry about every little detail of Amen. life. Whenever you get a word from God, you just go with it. Amen. I mean, if the Spirit leads you to do something, do it. You don't have to worry, well... What if this happens? Yeah. Should I do this? Should, just do it. Amen. And then as you do this, the Lord works it out. Mm -hmm. I mean, all these little details really don't matter. And you'll yeah. see that it'll work out for your good. You know, it, let me ask you, isn't that liberating? Yeah. Who was over? Brother Paul. This, this uh, statement, do not interpretations belong to God. Tell me then, I pray you. This is not a statement of arrogance or, right. or self-pride. Uh, about five centuries later, the magicians in Egypt are going to do the same thing, saying, we can do that trick too. See, I rise <laughs> oh, from yeah. the snakes. See, we can turn water into blood. There's going to come a point and say, we can't do that. That's so right. We, we, that's something we can't do. Amen. And Jesus, when he's, um, I mean, uh, the, it came a time when um, the Jews were persecuting him because of him saying the, the, that God is my father and he and I are one. Yeah. His response was, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is just because I seek not my will, but the will of the Father amen. which has sent me. Yeah. Amen. That's right. Amen. True back then, wasn't it? Yes, amen. Yeah. Mm. Yes, Sister Joan? I really, really liked your point about it being the land of the Hebrews. Yeah, yeah that was good. Because <laughs> there's a, there's a uh, temptation to, to look around and to see that relatively speaking in the world that the people were small mm. small in number <laughs> but the but the land is ours the land is ours amen amen amen, amen. amen. Yes. yeah this mattered that you that you pointed out about bitterness you know jesus here he is he's hanging on a cross they're killing him yeah. and he says father forgive them because yeah. they don't know what they're doing That's right but i think that most of the time when when, when I personally lash out, is I don't really see the whole picture, yeah, the big yeah. picture. I mean, it would have been easy. He could have just consumed them. Mm -hmm. But it, it was a bigger picture. It was something bigger going on. Mm -hmm. And so in the context yeah. of that, yeah. because they, they don't know what they're doing, well, then what's the right thing? Forgive them. Because Amen. he was dying in order that they could be forgiven. Amen. So he's, you know, if you want to be a minister of God, if you think you've been called to minister to the saints, you're going to have to, in your proportion, you're going to have to do the same thing. Yes. He's going to lead you through valleys yes. where the people don't understand what, they don't They don't know the implications of what they're doing. But if you can see it, and yes. then you can minister to them. Amen. Amen. Yes. Okay, Brother Judah. I found it intriguing that what you said about why Joseph was able to say, the interpretations of dreams belong to God. Now tell me your dreams. <laughs> That's right. You, you yeah. said that he could only do that because he was connected to God. Mm -hmm. I was reminded of the of John chapter 15, where Jesus says, "You can do nothing, yeah. or else, if unless you abide in the vine." Yeah. He says if you're so if you're not connected to the vine, the power mm -hmm. source, then you can do nothing. Yes, sir. But Joseph was able to say the interpretations of dreams belong to God. Now tell them to me was it a tribute to, to the fact that he was connected. Yeah, to God, yeah. Connected mm -hmm. to God. Amen. Brother Brett? I appreciated that you affirmed that God is taking all things and working them together yeah. for good. Yeah. Amen. I think that a lot of people think that when things do work out for good, that the things in their life or in other people's lives that appeared bad really weren't. Mm -hmm. And that takes glory away from God. Yeah, right. He takes things that, that, that didn't just seem to be bad, that's good. but that actually right. were bad. That's yeah, right. That's right. Yeah. And so yeah. that, that is really the power of God's yes. place. Oh, amen. Good point. I've, yeah. I've seen that myself. 
Those uh -huh. sheep of Job's really, really were burned up. <laughs> yes, That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I enjoy seeing that the Lord accomplishes a lot of different things at all at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. So when he was mm -hmm. when he was working these things out when Joseph was young, it was in lieu of him ruling Egypt. Yeah. And him ruling Egypt was also in lieu of all the Hebrews going down into Egypt. Mm -hmm. And all the Hebrews being down in Egypt was then in, in lieu of Moses leading them out of Egypt. And mm -hmm. so you got all this happening. And at the same time, you got Joseph uh, being a, a uh, testimony or a prophecy of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of this happening all at the same time Amen. confirms that the Lord's hand is, is in all of it. Yes. But it also enables us to see beyond our own circumstances yeah. and can save us from becoming uh, self-centered or self-seeking mm -hmm. to, to realize that something that we may be experiencing personally may have more significance for something else, mm -hmm. for someone else, or even another time That's right. and have less to do with us. Yeah. Very good. Amen. Very good. Mm -hmm. Part of seeing the superiority of the works of God being over that of the works of men is that we'll learn not to see the uh, works of, of people as independent from the use of God. Mm -hmm. That we can, we can trust that in whatever anyone is doing, that the Lord is managing even that. Yes. That's right. Amen. Amen. Yeah. This is crucial for us to see. This is God. <coughs> These are the works of God. This is God's agenda. Mm -hmm. work out, not just the circumstances. And you've made that point yeah. repeatedly again yeah. and again. This is, but it, it's crucial I, for you to see that. I find it, it, we do have to make it over and over because yeah. Yeah. Yes. it contradicts yes. sight yes. and this Amen. Amen. Yes. Yeah. It appears to contradict. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 But he is, he is working this out. He God was, was working these things, and he's working in us, too. That's right. So now that's the application. That's right. And it's a bigger agenda now than it was then, <laughs> so to speak. Amen. So to speak. It was the same agenda, but, uh, but we've entered into the fullness of it. Amen. Brother Mike? Prison, the, the prison house is not normally a happy place unless Joseph is there. That's yeah. right. Unless Joseph. I, I would have to attribute that because he was there. He was the one yeah. in charge to some extent. So it, it seems to me that that's, that's the only way that question could be appropriate is because of the environment yeah. Joseph created in Very the prison yeah. was yeah. such that it was unusual for the prisoners to be unhappy. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and also that Amen. I was reminded that's the same question the Lord asked the two on the road to Emmaus. That's right. Why are you sad? Yeah. We can see that parallel now, can't we? Oh, yes. Just because Amen. of what Jesus has done, we can be happy here. That's yes. right. Amen. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, the world say, why are you so happy? <laughs> yeah. And we ready, tell them. You're yeah. ready to give an answer for the hope. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Well, that was it. That's yeah. what Brother Jesus said. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. it has been able to see in us. Yes. That's the hope. Amen. The hope. That's, hope. That's, That's right. right. Mm. Amen. Yes, it's to do it. It gives you confidence in your trial when you look at it in that respect of what God is doing. Mm -hmm. It's like, He counts me worthy to go through this. Yes. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What he's put into me. He's yeah. showing me what he's put into me. Yes. That gives you confidence. Amen. And you rejoice so you can rejoice yes. in all things. Count it all joy. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yes. Yeah, I was also considering this fact about the, the sadness and the question that Joseph asked. If, if the prisoners were sad on a regular basis, Joseph wouldn't have asked that question. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yeah. there wouldn't have been an opportunity for the Lord to work obviously Amen. in the situation. Amen. Mm -hmm. So in in light of in our lives and things we you mentioned our countenance, maintaining that countenance and our conversation and things of that nature, so that there is opportunity for the Lord to work when there is a difference mm. in that. Yeah. Amen. 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 
Good words, man. Yes, amen. I just want to make a disclaimer here this evening to you, brethren, that we'll be at the renewal. I want you all to know that I did write my testimony before Brother Given spoke tonight. Okay. <laughs> just keep that in mind when I speak Tuesday. <laughs> I wrote it before I came to you. <laughs> and I can't wait to share it. <laughs> all right, we'll have a word of prayer. Are we have any father? We thank you for this record and for Joseph, your faithful servant. At a young age, enduring uh, all manner of difficulties and hardships, yet proving the resiliency of faith and how that when a person puts their faith in you that they can be an overcomer. And we seek this type of testimony, Lord, that our lives and our demeanor even our countenance might provoke people to inquire about our hope, and then we'll be able to glorify thee in giving an answer for it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.